Bună dimineața din nou și bine ați venit la prima sesiune de conținut a zilei. Astăzi începem festivalul cu o discuție despre de ce este nevoie de mai multă joacă în școli. Am vrut foarte mult să începem festivalul cu această discuție despre joacă și joc, pentru că am vrea să nu uităm cât de importantă este joaca totuși în dezvoltarea tuturor ființelor vii, indiferent de nivel, de vârstă, Există destul de multe, foarte multe cercetare științifică care arată că joaca are beneficii la absolut orice vârstă și chiar și adulții beneficiază de ea și că este un instrument pedagogic care e foarte generos, indiferent de contextul social sau pedagogic în care ne aflăm. Ne-am dorit să ieșiți din această sesiune cu mult mai multă motivație și inspirație să găsiți mai mult spațiu pentru joacă în școlile voastre și în clasele voastre și credem că avem exact invitatul potrivit, invitata potrivită să ne ajute să atingem acest scop și obiectiv. Eu o să fac acum doar câteva anunțuri în limba română și după aceea o să trec pe limba engleză, după cum o să vedeți, sesiunea este tradusă, este tradusă cu un instrument de AI despre care vă voi povesti imediat. Deci, anunțurile. Colegii mei vor pune încă o dată în chat patruturile de festival, ca să le aveți la îndemână, să puteți să urmăriți agenda. Acolo veți găsi și, la sfârșitul zilei de astăzi, resursele și prezentarea pe care ne va da invitatul noastră astăzi. Tot acolo ne puteți trimite în palătul de reflexii, vă aduceți aminte și reflexiile voastre cu privire la uh, ce ascultați și ce auziți astăzi. Nu uitați că ne puteți trimite întrebări pentru invitata noastră și reflexii pe tot parcursul sesiunii. Chiar v-aș încuraja să faceți acest lucru. Colegii noștri din chat, colega mea Natalia, o să preia aceste întrebări și o să ni le lase în așa fel încât să um, putem să le transmitem mai departe invitatei noastre. Uh, vă spuneam că sesiunea este înregistrată cu, este tradusă cu un instrument de traducere simultană. AI, care ca toate instrumentele AI, este imperfect. Pe de altă parte, din cât am reușit noi să verificăm, asigură o traducere decentă. Deci sperăm să poată ajuta pe absolut toată lumea care nu reușește să urmărească foarte bine limba engleză în, în prezentări. Și acum, mă uitam ca să văd ce urmează în scenariu, Um, pentru celelalte lucruri și în special ca să o introduc pe invitata mea, I am switching to English because it is a great, great joy to start this festival and this conversation with our next guest, uh, Fiona Kirkland, Play Pedagogy Officer at Play Scotland. Um, she will definitely tell us more about the organization she works with. I just want to tell you that by the moment I saw the website and the work that they have been doing in the last years, I just fell in love. And I said that this is absolutely perfect to, for our teachers and for our pedagogue. Fiona is herself a great pedagogue and she has worked with schools across Scotland uh, to develop a play agenda in educational settings. She also leads something very interesting, which I am looking forward to hear more about, the Play Scotland, uh, the Play Scotland Play Pedagogy Award, uh, about which you will definitely hear more from her. The Fiona, welcome. And thank you for joining us as a very at a very early hour, actually, uh, for you in the festival. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. thank you for having me. <laughs> um, as I said, it's hard to imagine from this Zoom where at, at this moment it's just, just us, but there are uh, 15,000 teachers attending the session and looking forward to our talk. So... As usual, less time with me means more time with our guest and more time with Fiona and definitely more time for questions. So I will invite Fiona to take over. I will stop my share screen and I will get back to you at the end of the session with more questions. Thank you, Fiona, so much Thank for you. being here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Um, so I'll just start my presentation then. I'm just going to quickly share my screen. Hopefully this will work. Oh, wrong screen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hmm. 
There we go. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for having me. And thank you for such a wonderful, such a wonderful start there, Elena. <laughs> I hope I can live up to expectations. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself. Um, as Elena said, I am um, Fiona Kirkland. I am the Play Pedagogy Officer at Play Scotland. Um, I have a background in early education and primary education. So in Scotland, early education is from zero to five and a primary education is from five to um, sort of around about 12 years old. So just to give you a bit of background about where we are. Um, so in, in, in my role as Play Pedagogy Officer, I work with schools and educators to develop a play agenda in educational settings and also I lead our Play Pedagogy Award, um, which aims to embed play pedagogy in schools across Scotland. Um, I also deliver training sessions on play theory and play pedagogy, and I'm also part of a team developing a new national qualification on play pedagogy. So you can imagine you know, how, how far ahead we are in Scotland, thankfully. So I work for Play Scotland, and in Scotland, Play Scotland are the lead organisation for the development and promotion of young children, um, ch children and young people's play. And we were established in 1998, so this is our 25th anniversary this year. Um, and our mission is to ensure that play is valued, prioritised and incorporated into the everyday lives of children. But it's not all play at Play Scotland. We do take our duties as champions of play and childcare practice very seriously. Um, we're leaders and campaigners in ensuring quality and accessible free play for all. We also work strategically and collaboratively with the Scottish Government, um, policymakers, educators, parents, communities to advocate for play. And pr we also provide resources and support for that as well. Um, we support national developments around children's human rights, including the place efficiency duty. And we are in the process of incorporating the UNCRC into Scots law. And um, so we've been pushing for that for a number of years. And really that's so that all children can reach their full potential and be able to confidently inhabit an inclusive public realm, as well as to help to shape those child-friendly communities. Um, we really believe that play is the best way to learn um, as it brings all, play, all, brings all learning together. And it really is an integral part of a happy, healthy childhood. So we are really lucky in Scotland. Um, our government recognises importance in play and we've had a national play strategy since 2013. Um, this is actually in the process of, um, we don't rest on our laurels, so it's actually been in the process of being um, looked at again, reviewed at the moment, um, which Play Scotland is a part of. Our vision is that we want Scotland to be the best place to grow up. I'm sure in Romania, probably you want the children in Romania to be the best place to grow up, but in Scotland we actually have our play strategy. That helps us do that. Um, and our mission at Play Scotland is to enable all children and young people to have equal opportunities to participate in diverse and quality play experiences that meet their individual needs. So at this we look at, you know, we, we sort of deal with inclusion, we deal with children um, accessibility. One of our recent things was looking at different play parks as well, um, which the play parks were very good for probably 80% of the children. However, those children with um, maybe in wheelchairs or um, with problems, you know, obviously to, to actually access the equipment. Um, so this is, we actually fed that information back to um, the local council to get them to make improvements as well. Um, and really you're looking, you know, we're, we're really looking to encourage play to be a quality play experience that meets everybody's needs. Now that also includes early intervention through play and creating increased and improved play opportunities, both indoors and outdoors. That's been a big thing in Scotland recently. I would say we're a very indoor um, society, <laughs> um, whereas um, what we're trying to be doing recently, a lot of our um, policy guidance is to encourage children to get outside every single day. Um, and that, you know, and obviously enjoy high quality play outside every day in stimulating spaces and with access to nature. Um, so even in some of our schools who, or who are very, you know, we've got like traditional um, concrete ground, you know, um, fences round about it. You know, some of our schools have done amazing work in those 
um, to develop that. And they're growing plants. They're, you know, one of our schools is like a jungle, you know, <laughs> it's amazing the things that they're actually doing um, to improve, you know, the, um, the environment for the children. Um, as you can imagine, we've all kinds of weather in Scotland. I'm sure you probably are the same in Romania. Um, it can be sunny, it can be rainy, it can be snowy, um, it can be windy. Today we've had hail, which is lovely. Um, if you hear it rattling against the windows. Um, <laughs> but obviously, we've, again, we're trying to push that, you know, to get children out to make sure they're properly Cutted out really. Um, one of my favourite um, phrases is there's no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. And I think that's true. Um, myself, I was a forest, I'm a trained forest kindergartner. So I've been out in all weathers. And sometimes the muddier, the better, you know, as long as we're properly attired. <laughs> um, let me just move on to the next slide. So moving on to the play pedagogy. So I'm really excited to be joining you today to talk about the growing interest of play pedagogy in Scotland and our partner encourage it and supporting teachers to embed that play pedagogy in their practice. Now, I'm, I'm sure you probably know this already, um, but at its core, play pedagogy is a child-centred pedagogy, and that really requires a commitment by educators to empower children to lead their own learning so they can develop the skills and abilities that they need to reach their full potential. Um, and at Play Scotland, we believe that a play pedagogy approach enables children, um, it enables their children's rights and it provides them with flexible opportunities to lead their own learning. Um, they can have new experiences, they can learn more about the world that they live in. And it also is great because it's a practice for the real world as well. You know, they can practice things and through play. Um, over the years, I've been very lucky to observe some great teachers um, who use their knowledge the, of knowledge and their theory um, knowledge of theory and their experience to consider not just what they do, but actually importantly, why they do it. Um, and when that happens and when they integrate that those play experiences with curricular learning, I've observed children being more motivated to learn and actually behaviour in the classroom quite often is better because the children are more engaged, they're more interested in what they're doing and they actually want to come to school um, because they're interested in what they're doing when they're actually there. Um, and at Play Scotland, we believe that play pedagogy is the best way to learn, as again, learning through play brings all learning together and most importantly, it's fun as well. So I'm going to show you, this is why is play pedagogy important. So there's loads of evidence um, around why um, play should be an integral part of children's development. It fosters creativity problem solving skills, social interactions, as well as contributing to their well-being. And theories have been linking play and child development for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and in recent years, actually, Scotland seems to have reappreciated this. Um, and there's more importance now being given to theories around allowing children to be children, you know, rather than being mini adults with some of the concerns of the adult world, you know, we're allowing children to be children, we're encouraging them to play, we're encouraging their natural curiosity. Um, and, you know, every child is born with that innate desire to learn and be creative. So we really in Scotland, we're really fostering this at the moment. Um, so the philosophy and ideas of theories such as Frederick Froebel, I don't know whether that's one that you work with, Elena, in Romania, Frederick Froebel, yeah. So he's become a really big influence in Scotland, actually, and he's really started to influence our guidance, our framework, our strategies. And especially in the early years, it started off in the early years, which, again, I spoke earlier on about, and that would be our sort of not our kindergarten stage, which would be not to five. Um, and it's really, it, it really has become really embedded into their our frameworks. Um, however, it's great to see that's actually gaining momentum into the primary schools as well, which, again, mm. is that like the five to 12 year olds mm -hmm. um, and I do remember I do remember learning about it in pedagogy school I don't think that for example there are schools or there are kindergartens that uh, are like for example Frobel kindergartens so like in Montessori kindergartens so I I don't think it has uh, so much traction here but indeed he's like his principles are absolutely wonderful and he has uh, written so much about it yes well, you'll probably find that actually those principles are already like actually in your kindergarten because it's things like kindness 
things like you know and and appreciating the natural environment and creativity all these things actually are you know together really you know and probably a lot of his principles will actually filter out but he is definitely um worth reading I actually was really lucky and I did a frobo course in the summer um at Edinburgh University and that really opened my eyes just to how brilliant Frobel is and his ideas um so he really believed that play was the highest form of learning and it brings all learning together and children also bring their own experiences into their play so if you've ever observed a child in the home corner or during role play you can actually see that they bring their own experiences into play um as Frobo believed because you can you know you can see them sort of pretending to lay the table, pretending to make the dinner, acting out things that they might see in their home, probably to the absolute horror of their parents, um, which is always good. <laughs> it gives you a wee insight into what's happening in people's houses. Um, and that kind of play provides opportunities for imagination, creativity, abstract thinking, and to try out what they've been learning about and to make sense of the world. Um, the other good thing about it is children can actually try out new things and then they can make mistakes and learn from their mistakes. However, I am I have two children um, and I find that sometimes my children who are quite old now, they can they have to make those mistakes multiple times before they learn from them. Um, especially my daughter was setting an alarm <laughs> and getting up in time. <laughs> So I'm just going to move on. This is a great, um, we have a really good um, new policy document in Scotland called Realising the Ambition um, by Education Scotland. And that is based at the early years. However, it's a fabulous document. And this is actually um, an image taken from the actual document. But I think it is such a good, good image, you know, for any teacher or educator to look at. You know, you're looking at you're, that observation, the interpretation, the documentation of learning. Then you've got your responsive intentional planning and then your facilitation and it's a nice circle you can see just how how it actually works if you're interested in looking at the realizing ambition if you there's a website that you can look at and it's education scotland and it's just called realizing the ambition being me and it was 2020. so with things like this over the last decade there's been a growing realization by policymakers that learning, development and play are interlinked and that play stimulates and engages and offers children challenge and enjoyment. And it's really started to become embedded in Scottish educational policy frameworks and guidance. Um, there's that recognition of the importance of listening to children's voices and taking the lead from the children. However, we realise that it's not easy. Um, it can involve a total culture change in schools and it can be a challenge as well to integrate it into the curriculum. Um, ensuring that interactions and experiences are child-led and not driven by adults. And I think it can be really hard um, to encourage adults to stand back because I think you have an actual inclination as a teacher to show them how to do it properly and, you know, to teach and to be involved in that learning. But actually, um, it's it's all worth, you know, sort of looking back. And sometimes it's a good job to actually be observing learning, which is interesting. Um, you know, we've got great things on our website about the play cycle, which is really interesting again as well about, you know, being invited into that play, and which, which is really interesting. Um, and at Scotland, we are, at Play Scotland, we're really lucky to see examples of play pedagogy theory-led practice. And we can see firsthand the benefits to children, teachers and schools. Um, so we decided, you touched on this earlier on, so we decided to develop this further and roll ac across the country so that all children, teachers and schools could benefit. And that's why we developed our Play Pedagogy Award. Um, over the years, we've been looking and thankfully the curriculum in Scotland has become more active and more play-based learning, um, which really is a step in the right direction. Um, as we know that play stimulates, it engages, it offers children challenge and enjoyment. Um, you know, when I started in teaching, it was very much that the teacher stood at the front of the at the front of the room and the children all sat on desks and they watched the teacher. Now, if you come into a school in Scotland, some of our schools don't even really have the sort of formal layout of a, of a classroom. They're very, particularly in our younger children, they're very active. You know, you'll have areas where they can sit together, they can um, they can interact, they can. There's maybe sand, there's maybe water that they can interact with. Um, junk modelling, you know, all the boxes and things that we would throw away in our recycling. Um, you know, that's it's great. Um, and that really is, 
it's really changed in Scotland. Um, I mean, it's not changed everywhere. It's there's still teachers who like the traditional, but you know, we're trying to trying to encourage them. Um, and really, it's all about learning and co-construction as well, which is really which is really interesting. Um, I'm just going to move on. So basically, as I say, change is really in the air in Scotland. Um, and over the years, I've experienced really good and maybe not so good pedagogy in schools. Um, but it's led me to firmly believe that it's about empowering children to lead their own learning um, so they can develop those skills and abilities that they need to reach their full potential. And I think modern theory-led teaching is different from that traditional of moulding children into the ideal. You know, not all children we can't mold them you know they're, they're not they, I know they don't really come as empty vessels do they it's you know that we fill with it like information you know that they, they've got their own um lives they've got their own families they've got their own influences and um, you know and, and really in Scotland we are really encouraging children to be individuals and to have a voice as well um, and I think as well obviously in Romania um Covid was quite a big factor as well that really did change an awful lot of things um, but I think after COVID, we really are thinking that because children were at home for so long as well, because I, I take it you did sort of lockdowns as well, Elena, did you have lockdowns and yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I think I think the lockdowns uh, and school closures were probably among the, the, the longest in Europe and that definitely affected both academic performance, but also I think the social and emotional development of, uh, of children. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah I think it plays a, a big uh, role including in why we are talking about play today <laughs> well it does it's that post you know it really is it's mm. more important than ever really because mm. we all know it helps children's holistic development mm. it encourages good mental health I know we've got a, a mental health, health crisis in this country you know and I think that's I'm sure everybody's the same you know these children were at home for such a long time with no opportunity for socialization um, apart from you know their immediate family um, and it's great because play also um, encourages develops confidence self-esteem and also importantly how to control their emotions as well mm -hmm. um, so we see in Scotland we have some fantastic what we would call play pioneers so we have like all over Scotland there's these little schools and teachers who have been like seeing how great play is for years and using play you know as a form of sort of um, you know in their learning um, and teaching um, and it's great that actually that we can now bring these together and there's all this expertise. Um, so it, and it really does. So we've developed our Play Pedagogy Award. Um, so before the award, we had um, feedback from teachers that they really desired that strategic level support and um, resources and specific expertise to develop Play Pedagogy led practice. And basically what they wanted as well, because they were doing something a little bit different, they wanted that endorsement that they're actually doing the right thing, you know, because they care about their children. They don't want to set their children up to fail. Um, you know, so it's that whole, um, you know, making sure that it's right. Um, so we're very lucky um, that, you know, we, we are actually, our play pedagogy can inspire these children um, and these teachers to take play pedagogy. And we're aiming to have it across the whole school um, right from early years, right to sort of what we would class as primary seven. So that's children who are sort of 12. Um, and our Play Pedagogy Award, um, we, we already have great, you know, have a look at our website once I'm finished. It's fantastic. Play Pedago um, PlayScotland.org. It's great. Um, there's so many resources on there. Um, so we already have great resources to encourage play and we're building that. So we've got a three stage award system. Um, which starts, um, but really, you know, we're looking to to put this across the whole school um, and embed play in school practice and ethos, protect play times and showcase learning through play. So just briefly, our award has three stages. We have a planning stage, we have an implementation stage, and then the last stage, which is our assessment stage, and that would be the award stage. Um, and what we would ask schools to do is to describe their play pedagogy journey. So where they started, where they are now and how they got there and also how they involve their children, their families, their communities on that journey as well as their teachers. Obviously we realise that no two play pedagogy journeys are going to be the same. That would be really boring actually if they were. 
I think, you know, for for myself, like reading them, I think it would be if everybody just ticked the box, it would be very boring. Um, you know, I'm sure Romania is like us, you know, we've got urban areas, we've got rural areas, we've got schools that maybe have one teacher, we have schools that have 20 teachers. So every every um, play pedagogy journey is going to look slightly different um, and also at different stages of the school as well. You know, when you're looking at, you know, your little ones, you know, their play bedage is very much about free play and interacting and, um, you know, discovery. Whereas when you go up the school um, and maybe up to the sort of, sort of senior part of the school, it's really more about inquiry and creativity as well. Uh, my um, Sherry, my boss, always tells a good story about, you know, giving children um, like junk, what we call junk modelling. So things like old cereal boxes and lids like um bottle lids and things like that um and you know giving them these and saying to them right make a car so you've got your little ones who just their creativity is just amazing and they'll maybe make a car with 10 wheels fifth you know five windows um it'll not necessarily look like any car you've ever seen but then when you go up the school then the children you give them the same equipment and the children up the school will say, well, what is it supposed to look like? You know, and it's that it's that sort of suffocating, that creativity of, of the older children as we go on. They're, they're, they're assuming that they've got to do, there's, there's, there's only a right answer. But actually what we want to do is to actually increase that creativity and really push that on with our children. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit, a story about, um, so I know you said about little examples of what we were doing. So we've got um, two of our schools actually helped us develop the Play Pedagogy Award. Um, so this is a school in the heart of Glasgow. Um, it's, I think they've got 350 pupils. 70% um, of those children have English as an additional language. So straight away, you know, you've got that, and it's multiple languages as well. Um, so that can be quite, quite tricky. Um, so they have been doing play pedagogy. They've been on their play pedagogy journey for a really long time. Um, and to be honest, they're, they're fabulous. You know, it's an absolute joy to go into the school and see them. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about a learning adventure. Um, so what basically happened, it was during an autumn, and this is primary two one. So these children are probably, probably around about six years old. Um, so I'm just going to quickly pop into the next bit. So at the start of their journey to develop their learning adventure, um, the school can consider the curriculum experiences and outcomes that they wanted to cover. So in Scotland, we have the Curriculum for Excellence. So it, it, it actually runs from the age of three to the age of 18. It's the same curriculum for kindergarten, primary school and secondary school. So all the children have the same curriculum and it is full of outcomes and um, experiences. So you'll have like, and, and it's sort of split into sections. So you'll have like your literacy, your maths, your science, your technology. Um, you also have things like religious and moral education. All these things are split into sections and they each have sort of a number. Um, and the aim is, I think, for teachers to sort of cover as many of these as they possibly can by the time that the children get to, you know, get to the end of secondary school. Um, so it's, it's seen as a sort of, um, it's it's a great, I, I personally think it's a great curriculum. Um, it has its critics. But I like it. <laughs> and I think it's good because being in early years, you can see actually how it works. You know, it can, mm -hmm. you know, even silly wee things like um, getting the children to sit together and, have a you know a game of pass the parcel you know sometimes things like that are actually looked down upon but if you think about it you know those children are actually you know they're they're um they're sitting together so that's social they're sharing because they're having to pass the the parcel around i don't know do you play pass the parcel in romania mm. so it'd be a box to remember okay and it has lots and lots of different layers of wrapping paper no, I don't think I have ah. ever, I've ever played it. No, 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 no. But so, just wanted to add something, Fiona, before yeah. you describe the game, just for everybody to understand that curriculum for excellence doesn't mean, uh, it's not related necessarily to 
academic performance as, as far as I have understood the curriculum, as I said, but it's rather a more holistic approach of what it means an excellent child, which means like a fully developed child, not necessarily just an, uh, you know, child that has good grades <laughs> in schools or performs very well in exams. Am I Have I understood correctly this? Yes, you have. Perfect. Okay, thank you. And now pass the parcel. <laughs> Tell us about it. Let's let's oh, play the game. It's a great game. So most birthday parties in Scotland have a, a game called pass the parcel. So you have maybe a present. So um, quite often nowadays it's like a little packet of sweeties, uh, you know, sweets, candy, right? Which probably is very frowned upon. Um, and you wrap it in a part in, in wrapping paper, and then you wrap that wrapping paper. And more wrapping paper, and you wrap the parcel again in more wrapping paper. So you could have maybe sort of 10. <laughs> so a thing that's maybe starts off that size suddenly becomes this size. So what we do is we get our children in a circle, and they sit in a circle, and we put music on, and we get the parcel and we pass it to the next person. So it goes round in the circle, pass, 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 pass. And when the music stops, the person who's holding the parcel takes off a layer of wrapping paper. Now, we don't know whether that's going to be the, the very last one and they get the, the candy, or whether, unfortunately, it's disappointment, there's another layer of wrapping paper. So games like this are so good, though, because the children are sitting together, they're sharing, they're turn-taking, um, they're actually looking at something that's big that becomes small, you know, they're actually, the physical, they're actually taking off the wrapping paper, you know, so it's physical. Um, and also dealing with disappointment as well if they're not the ones that get the get the, the candy at the end of it. So all these things are actually, you know, you're looking at sort of like social subjects, you're looking at maths, you know, changing shapes, you're looking, you know, at sharing, you're looking at listening to music. There's so many things that actually this, what we would class as a silly little game actually covers on our curriculum which is amazing you know when you think about it when you actually think about it it's it's quite astounding um so what they did was I'll go back to this school <laughs> now um, so they started off with looking at the our curriculum and choosing some of the um the outcomes and the experiences of the curriculum um so there was different things like literacy maths health well-being technology and what they did was um, they, they looked at how they were going to actually do this with the children. The, the, you know, the things that they could actually do, the experiences and the teaching they could do to cover these. Um, so things like, um, I have observed living things in the environment over time and I am becoming aware of how they depend on each other. So that's one of our science ones. Um, our social studies one, I explore and discover interesting features of my local environment to develop an awareness of the world around me. Um, you know, so these, the maths one as well, is I am aware of how routines and events in my world link with times and, oh, I can't read that very well, and have explored ways to record and display these using clocks, calendars and other methods. So this is the sort of things that the teachers actually wanted. That was their focus, right? So, and what they did later on as well, because the the, the, the children lead the learning um with just they, they put in learning provocations during free play um, and they looked at the children's reaction and they used that to inform further learning as well. So what they did was they took the children to a local park um, and in the park they saw a squirrel, right? So this squirrel then was great excitement for the children. Quite Squirrels are not that common in Scotland. They're common-ish, but not, not too common. So obviously the children were so excited about this squirrel and that led the teacher to her first learning provocation really um, because the meeting sparked lots of interest the children wanted to invest investigate further so <clears throat> the class then collected leaves as well in the park and they used them and uh, the resources for a number of autumn art activities and experiences and that included things like leaf rubbing and leaf printing and um, and then the teacher then used a combination of teacher planned opt in activities. So she had areas of the classroom where the children could come and join and she would do teaching, like formal teaching. But she also had what they call free flow play. So she had little areas set up where the children could go and do 
you know, she would have like open resources there. Um, so you would have things that the children could maybe like wooden blocks or um, I think she had like obviously just had popped some of the leaves down as well. So things like that are really, you know, they're really interesting. Um, so, yeah, so they did that. So um, and they watched the, the squirrel in the park and that led them to, to lead their own learning as well. Um, and that learning adventure then encompassed a wealth of science, technology, engineering and maths. As we call it in Scotland STEM and creative outcomes and working together as a group also promoted that health and those health and well-being outcomes such as sharing, collaboration, listening to and respecting the views and ideas of others as well. Um, the children then observed, they, you used the, the squirrel puppets, the teacher put, put squirrel puppets out for them to use, and that really developed um, their understanding. Um, and things like building a, a dray, so I didn't realise that they call a squirrel's nest a dray. So one of the wee boys actually had discovered that he had a squirrel in his garden. So it was great because he then was able to talk about it and take pictures of it and bring it in, which again, I'm sure in, in, in Romania, you like that learning from home links as well. Yeah, so this brought in this learning this learning from home. Um, so the, the children looked at how to build an appropriate dray. You know, what would be a good, what would make a good dray? What would maybe not make a good dray? So again, problem solving. Um, and things like what what sort of food should we give the squirrel? You know, should we give the squirrel a McDonald's? Probably not. Would it like nuts? Probably. You know, so all these things are are quite interesting again, and that you know it, it helped the, the children to to be inquisitive. One of the great things that we are very good at here in Scotland um, when we do our play pedagogy is about asking using open ended questioning. Um, so that's things like. Mm, I wonder if, or what would happen if? And that's a great thing to be able to take into your practice. So rather than telling the children, right, do this, you know, you can actually encourage them to um, by saying, hmm, I wonder if we put a plastic bag into the dray, would the squirrel like that? Then the children say, probably not. You know, I wonder if we got lots of um, um, leaves and twigs and made it together. Do you think this going to, you know, so it's 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 that I wonder if it's it's that co-creation with the children and that open the open-ended questioning. And um, one of the things as well that they, they were allowed the children did as well, they actually shared their learning with the wider community in the school, um, which promotes confidence um, and it develops those key communication skills as well. And also it's it shows that actually they've they don't just they haven't just learned it, but they actually understand it. You know, they're able to tell more people about it, um, which is great. Um, and the other thing they did as well was further on to that, they visited like local gardens and the community garden and they decided they would become really interested in um, vegetables. Um, and at the time it was Halloween, which is ironic because it was Halloween yesterday. Um, and that, that led them into the, the subject of um, pumpkin soup. So you can see how this is actually sort of naturally flowing across the, you know, across the term, you know, from squirrels, what do squirrels eat, vegetables, growing, going to see growing vegetables, then reading the story of pumpkin soup, and then they actually made their own pumpkin soup as well. If you can see the children, um, they're actually cutting up the pumpkins, they're cooking the pumpkins, um, and I'll just show you the next one here, which is actually them eating the soup. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a shame you can't show, I can't show their faces, but there's I can assure you there's lots of happy faces there um, eating their pumpkin soup. So they were helping grow the vegetable. They helped make it into soup and then they were eating it. I mean, that's it's, it's a process, isn't it, that then the children can understand. Um, they also had uh, lots of seasonal resources as well. So they added um, these provocations of the pumpkins throughout different areas. Um, as you can see at the, you know, the, the one in the sort of left hand side. So one of the things they did was counting the pumpkin seeds as well. They put that into the maths area and um, in the creative area, you know, they were able to make the pumpkins. They were able to draw pumpkins. You know, you can see how that's that sort of thing that the children are interested in is sort of threading through the whole day of the school. Um, and it really is quite fascinating to watch. Um, so the, the teachers, by the end of the term, they got together to reflect on how, it, you know, how everything had gone. 
And they found that the individuals and groups of children had taken ownership over that squirrel learning provocation, they'd added their own ideas, the used materials of their own choosing, and that then developed a learning path as a result. So the children were actually, they were actually developing that learning path um, out of their own interests. Um, during sort of observation, they found that the free play provided children with an opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding and apply new skills. Um, and that was really, an felt that was an indication of purposeful learning environment, um, particularly during the role play with their squirrel puppets. Um, Self-evaluation, which is really important. I think as a teacher, you know, you have to reflect on that and look at how ways you can improve. Um, this school, as I said at the start, they are really quite far ahead with their, on their play pedagogy journey. They've been doing it for a long time. And actually they're at the point where their curriculum is nearly delivered almost entirely through play. Um, aside from core subjects such as literacy and numeracy, we still have sort of testing in Scotland. So, you know, it's that attainment you've got to, you know, you've got to hit these markers. Um, and they were able to facilitate that through a combination of planned activities, learning prov provocations and free play. And really by being flexible with the experiences and outcomes that they covered, um, it allowed them more freedom and flexibility within the curriculum. So they ended up covering things that maybe they wouldn't normally cover, but it was because the children had led them in that direction. Um, and they're lucky, they have a great head teacher um, who really supports them and is really encouraging um, and is and that's given them the confidence to pursue a play-based curriculum. And I think that's really important. It's getting the buy-in of the head teacher, you know, that importance of doing what, you know, encouraging the head teacher to understand what you're trying to do. Um, and luckily in Scotland, that seems to be coming coming round, thankfully. Um, again, that sort of theory into practice, they, they, they actually demonstrated they had a wide knowledge of play theory. So I think it's reading, isn't it? It's reading and educating yourself to understand what you're actually doing. And again, not just the what you're doing, but why you're doing it. And I think that's what makes great teachers. Um, and during that their play pedagogy journey, they developed their free flow play model. Um, they observed all of the interests of the children. So they scaffolded learning. So, you know, you looked at sort of like how, you know, the children, um, you know, teachers put in support at the start. And as the child started to develop and be able to do more and more themselves, then you take that, you know, that support away so that the child can do it independently, which is great. And what they try to do is they have them try to maintain that balance of teacher led and teacher initiated and child initiated activities throughout their school day. And I'm just going to put this up here. So this is actually uh, some of the resources we have at Play Scotland. So as I said, we have a fantastic website. Um, you can actually join Play Scotland as well. You don't have to live in Scotland. Membership is free. <laughs> and you would get a newsletter. Um, we do a newsletter every month and it tells you what's happening in Scotland. But you might find it quite interesting. Um, for instance, our next newsletter, um, there's a great report by um, Dr Lily Fitzgibbons and Professor Helen Dodds that they've written for Play Scotland, and that's about the state of play in Scotland. So it looks at, um, you know, play being fun, it's important for children's wellbeing, um, diversity of spaces and activities, you know, all these things, barriers to play as well. So um, that's, um, yeah. So that's that's what we can we do as well. So there's also a little QR code. And if you want to join, there's a member. There's actually a bit on our website for to join as a member as well. And we do things like we do we're part of Play Day, which is um, so it's Play Scotland, Play England, Play Wales, Play Northern Ireland. We all get together on a certain day and we have a day of play. Um, we have a fantastic podcast that we produce every month and um, that we chat with people who are to do with play. Um, sometimes not. It, recently, I spoke to um, two lovely ladies who were full of passion about museums and how to get children into the museums and make the museums less stuffy places to visit. And um, so we do lots and lots of different things. And um, our loose parts play toolkit is, you know, we we um, people down. There's thousands of those every year downloaded. And um, our play and storytelling was about intergenerational play. So we had. Um, you know, like storytelling, you know, for sort of grannies or, or grandmas or papas. Um, and then we've got our play toolkit and we also do OPAL, which is outdoor play and learning. So 
I'm going to just stop sharing now. I was thinking, thank you so much, Fiona, for all these resources. I was also myself, you know, in on my own self-reflective uh, process, you know, I was uh, looking at it, listening, and I was thinking that, for example, some of it is very similar to what we do at the um, uh, primary school level and preschool level, which is called, I think, integrated curriculum in Romania. But I think it's a bit more than that because still the integrated curriculum in Rom Romania is, is, is still have some boundaries. And I, I don't think it usually integrates so much of a free play, which means things that children bring into the mix, into it. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking, how could we expand it? And I was thinking also about I I took myself this uh, this thing regarding the open ended questions. I mm -hmm. think it's so important. It has to do with patience, isn't it? Uh, sometimes because we are so caught in this idea that we have forty minutes, fifty minutes, you know, and we have this academic uh, objectives that we need to push forward to our children. We have so little patience in you know just stopping and waiting a bit for an answer be before giving suggestions. And I saw, I remember in my own pedagogical training that I was looking at children and I was immediately saying, you know, how about, uh, let's put this here so they can speed up a bit the process. But now I'm thinking like, how nice is just to be mindful that you're hurrying, mm -hmm. count to, to three, you know, just stop. <laughs> And then remember, <laughs> remember what Fiona said. And Fiona said, maybe start with a question. I wonder if uh, this or that could happen or and then stop again for the answer. And I'm happy that we are discussing this because we have a great session today about how can you learn all these tips and tricks uh, uh, in uh, having cool and productive dialogues with your students, no matter the level that you, you are brought in. I invite again everyone to send questions to our colleague in chat who will send, us, send it to us. But until then, I have like a, a question and I wanted to, to ask you a bit to discuss a bit more about um, outside play and free play. Mm -hmm. This yeah. can be connected or not necessarily. But mm -hmm. outside play... Outside play is such an important part of children development, isn't it? And this idea oh. that this is why this is why we have breaks, even in this festival. This is why we have breaks, because you need to move. And being outside is such a wonderful, wonderful place. Sometimes even if you're outside, I don't know, in a in a concrete garden, you know, in a concrete courtyard. So you have said it yourself. We also have a lot of, uh, let's say, school courtyards that are not necessarily inducive to play, meaning that they don't have uh, play things in it, like swings or other things. So what are the, I don't know, what are the methods? What are the things that you have seen with your schools, for example, uh, that have been successful in promoting and in increasing outside play for their children, no matter the level. Yeah. So one of the things that we actually have at Play Scotland is a thing called our play, our loose parts play kit. So what some people would say it's junk, basically. It's things like tires. It's things like things that people would throw away. Um, and we've brought a lot of that into, you know, like um, wooden um you know, wooden things, um, like stones, sticks, things that you would find in nature um, as well. Um, even things like sort of crates, you know, um, boxes, things like that. We've actually started to put a lot of those sort of things outdoors um, and the children then can use them for creativity. Um, so they can build with those. They can, you know, I've seen some children do fantastic things <laughs> with them. You know, things like um, wooden you know, like wooden blocks as well, you know, like just um, pieces of pieces of um, trees, you know, things like that. It's very much we've we've gone very much back to nature in Scotland. So it's it, so we have a great loose parts play kit um, that you can download from our website, which is for, it's free and it gives some fantastic ideas of things that you can you can do. But what you really want is um, if you think about play parks.
people need to to have that that risk that risky play um, and we need to promote that um, but again it's what we would class is sort of open-ended equipment you know so in Scotland we've got lots of open-ended equipment out, outside um, which is things that you can they don't have one purpose so you can use them for anything like tyres you know I've seen children rolling with tyres I've seen schools where they've put them in the ground and they plant in them so they fill them with soil and plant plants in the tires. Um, I've seen them like huge tires where they actually sit and have snack. You know, and they 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 sit and you know sit on the tires. And um, there's so many things that you can do, and that would just be probably sent to landfill. You know, so and it's things like that: tires and bricks and um, like wooden planks, things like that. But there's so many things that you could do. Mm. So it doesn't have to cost a fortune. <laughs> <laughs> I I am taking for this this idea of open ended materials, mm-hmm. so things that don't necessarily have a, um, a a purpose, a single purpose, but things that can be used to multiple purpose. I anticipate a bit uh, um, another question that I think uh, you know, especially now that we are discussing at the digital festival, teaching the future. So probably the use of um, technology by the children you know the, the the time that they spend on screens either at home or sometimes even at school definitely sometimes can make at least some of them less interested in spending time outside mm-hmm. so or at least probably and i think there are there are multiple studies that they sh- have shown that with uh, with heavy usage of screens There is a decrease in creativity, especially in creativity regarding the outside space, you know, and sometimes children will ask, you know, how can I play with these? (laughs) Uh, I have no idea how to play with this because this is not Minecraft. You Mm -hmm. probably you're, you're probably facing or your teachers are probably facing the same challenges, you know, how how can you make children play outside, especially preteens, for example, when they would definitely love just to stay on their mobile phones and play like forever the entire break. What are some of the things that your school have done to count uh, counter this? So what what you have to do, what one of the things we do, we have a thing called OPAL, which is outdoor play and learning, and we have an expert, Simon Knight, who goes out and he speaks to schools about how they can develop their playtimes. So sometimes as well, children are bored. You know, children sometimes that's why they don't want to go outside. There's nothing for them to do. And what you really need there is you need an experienced teacher that's, you know, that knows what they can do outside, basically. And again, it's the same as you would do in the classroom. It's that belt bringing in that learning provocation, you know, something that the children are going to be interested in. And sometimes it's role modelling as well. You know, it wouldn't be the first time that I've been rolling about a tyre, you know, and making, and you find you do it yourself. <laughs> and then suddenly you're surrounded by children helping you. And they then turn it into something completely different than you had in mind. But, you know, you're, you're, you're doing that sort of role modelling, you're doing that provocation. Um, and sometimes it's just getting them started. Um, we're very good in Scotland. We do a lot of forest kindergarten. So we take children into the woods. Um, and we also do forest schooling as well. So again, classes go to the woods. And that actually, you can see it, that children in Scotland actually have become a lot more interested in doing things. You know, they're the ones that will say to their parents, let's go for a walk at the weekend and we'll go to the woods. You know, and it's amazing that the amount of parents I've spoken to in the past that have said, Oh, you know, my child was really keen. You know, you'd you'd been there with the nursery, um, or the kindergarten, uh, doing a thing last week, and they wanted to take me out to show me what you did. And we went there on Sunday, and we played in that area, and we built a we we built a den from sticks that were lying around. You know, so this is things it's it's engaging children, and mm-hmm. outdoor learning is fantastic. You can do so much outdoors, things that you can do in the classroom but you just can bring them outdoors and you can do them on a larger scale or a messier scale. You know, you can do painting outside. You can do, there's so many things you can do outside. You can do maths outside, you know, and you can do it in a big way. You know, Mm. science is fabulous outside. So I think the the conclusion, the morale is that if you want your children to spend more time outside, you should at least take them outside. You should take them as a teacher outside and make sure maybe you are there with them, 
not only in breaks, because maybe that's uh, another thing, but you can schedule every now and then an hour outside when there's good weather, but maybe also when there's not such wonderful, wonderful weather, weather, and we can learn more about why is this weather not wonderful. Uh, <laughs> the weather's a science teacher, isn't it? It's that environment yes. getting your, you know, the, it wouldn't be the first time we've went out with really windy days with ribbons or big sheets of things and blowing them away, you know, and chasing after them. The amount mm -hmm. of fun we've had doing activities like that. Mm -hmm. um, so rain, you know, gauging the rain, like, you know, leaving things out to when, you know, there's so much, it's, it's, you know, that environment is there for you to embrace and use. Yeah. So no matter where we are, you know, we can still schedule some hours outside. So make sure that our children learn to <laughs> re-engage with whatever it is outside. Maybe use on our own schoolyards as a exploratory area, you know, and just let's explore what the what is out there mm -hmm. um so i took from this this idea that um, let's take our children outside every now and then maybe even uh, next uh, next week when the school starts again it is still gorgeous wonderful weather in uh, in romania so i think we can still benefit from that or even if it's not nice so it lucky. will still be wonderful <laughs> it will still be wonderful i'm taking from the session this idea of uh, open ended questions and uh, including them in the dialogues that we have in children and letting them more to I don't know, direct the type of play that they want to do and the type of activity that they want to do. I'm also taking uh, out from this the fact that you have amazing resources and I'm looking forward to send to our, our teachers our website where they can uh, connect and uh, they can translate them. Uh, what's good about technology is that there, is, there are a lot of automatic translators out there which can do a proper decent job with translating so even if you don't know english we can definitely contact uh, connect to the materials that you you have recommended thank you so much for all of this fiona thank you so You're much um, we have been so um, happy to have you here with us i will switch to romanian just a bit for the final details um before the break thank um, you thank you for having me thank you oh, for it's pleasure. been lovely it's a it's a it's such a wonderful experience to start your day with a scottish accent this is what i always say <laughs> I hope I'm to translate me well <laughs> well thank you thank you so much Switching a bit to Romania now, vă mulțumesc tuturor pentru atenție, pentru întrebări și pentru reflecții. Um, o să mergem și o să facem o scurtă pauză de 15 minute acum, pentru că toate lucrurile bune trebuie să aibă și pauză din când în când. După aceea ne vom întoarce cu două sesiuni în paralel, una despre um, evaluare. Va fi live, Livia, colega mea, vă așteaptă cu domnul Constantin Lomaca la o discuție live despre evaluare. De la mine, deocamdată, la revedere, până la sesiunile de networking de la prânz. Mulțumesc foarte mult!